This conference will now be recorded. Go ahead. I was just wondering where that uh, cover crop question came from about the snow geese. That came from uh, Illinois. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that came from Illinois, and, and I can put you in touch with David if you desire uh, later on. So, well, hey, let's get started today with our uh, topic. It is cover cropping strategies for short season cold climates. And uh, uh, this is just something that is, as cover crops continue to grow, uh, it is something that is like everywhere on the planet, there seems to be a space for them. Now, I just want to clarify something today. We're not talking corn, soybean rotations. Uh, the, the subject of my topic basically is is about like a three-month growing season. I am going to uh, casually mention a little bit, uh, but we're not talking about, you know, getting out early and planting corn in the snow and stuff like that, like you see in this picture. But I'm going to kind of stay in a colder, shorter season climate from that. Now, there's things that all of us can learn through this topic. Uh, and, and and that's partly the point of, of doing it, because I know there's not a lot of people that live in these areas, but nonetheless, some of the variables that we want to address today, and I think the biggest one is understanding summer day length. And, and I say this mainly for those who don't live in the short season climate. Um, and I'm going to talk about how that is really, really significant in, in the potential of what you can do. And then areas that typically receive snow versus areas that don't uh, is, a, is another uh, part. And then there's a huge uh, variable in grazing versus non-grazing. And I'll just say, just like everywhere else, but even to a greater extent, I think grazing in a northern climate where cattle are is, is clearly the ideal. Also with the, uh, the potential for intercropping or companion cropping, and we have some uh, farmers are on this call today. I'd like to hear a little bit more from them about it. And I'll just say the potential to interseed in a cash crop. This would be the northern fringe of corn growing areas. So I'm just going to touch on that a little bit. And then perennial versus annual species and some of the pros and cons. And then I'm going to wrap up. I teased you, some of you a little bit in the, in the Facebook group and my emails if you saw them about the moose factor. So uh, I'll leave you hanging with that a little bit, but it's just some interesting uh, interesting um, uh, story that I that I heard about uh, moose and cover crops. So, uh, can you grow cover crops in northern latitudes? This is actually Wedgwood, Alberta. I'll be here at this location uh, the end of this week. I'm going to be speaking up there Friday and Saturday. And um, as, as this picture goes back to I believe 2012 or 2013. Uh, with this is this is some radishes that were grown in that area. Uh, we're going to talk about species and so forth, but uh, this is uh, six hours drive north of Calgary, Alberta. So if you know anything about it, uh, Western Canada, this is pretty far north. It's um, it's a couple hours south of the Yukon, but uh, but just to give you a uh, th this area right here, typically last frost is the end of May, first frost beginning of September. So just to give you an idea of of their climate and 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 how that works and so forth. I have a couple other areas around the world that I have been in contact with, talked with, consulted for. Again, pretty much the same latitude as Wedgwood, Alberta is is over the country of Sweden. Again, using radishes after wheat here was seen to be very effective. Again, you're not seeing the huge uh, growth. Uh, Finland as well in that area. And I apologize for sticking with radishes, but that was what I, I've been most familiar with in the past. There are other cover crops we're going to talk about, but I am saying that radishes do very well in these northern climates. And we'll talk a little bit about why uh, uh, coming up as we go through. So let's focus in here on that issue of summer day length. And, and again, for those of you who are not from these areas, um, I'll give you the quick example uh, some of you may have heard about the huge vegetables that could be grown in um, in Alaska. And like you'll see cabbages that are almost literally almost a foot and a half, two foot in diameter and all kinds of these huge vegetables. And they do that because the days are so long. Sometimes there's up to 18 hours of sunlight. Uh, depends how far north you go. Uh, so what 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 happens is crops do respond to sunlight. 
So more sunlight equals a more rapid growth. And this is why you can grow cover crops in areas where you would think you, there's no way possible uh, to do it. Now, granted, the cropping systems are different. No, this is not in the corn soybean rotation, just to be clear on that. But that being said, this is it's very, you need to understand how uh, this actually works simply from a, a day length uh, perspective. And it, and it allows you to do that. I was just talking to my cousin's son uh, where I'm going to be going here this weekend in, in northern Alberta. And he said, coming from my area here in southeastern Pennsylvania and moving up there, he said it's amazing what they can produce over the summer months. So uh, it's, it's definitely it's definitely a key factor in what we're doing. The other thing I want to mention here is it depends where you're located geographically. If you have uh, tend to have snow cover versus no snow cover. Basically, this is if you're in a drier area, you're tend, going to tend not to have snow cover. If you're a lake effect or an area where there's more snow, you're going to have snow cover. And that makes a big difference if you're trying to grow species over the winter. Most of these places here, it's just not possible to grow much over the winter. It's just too cold for too long. And the dormancy just does not work. Uh, that being said, there are areas where uh, because of the snow cover, the options open up greatly. And so that's a factor. Now, again, not to uh, dominate Alberta here, uh, but uh, in, in talking with my, my cousin, right now they, they have 12 inches of snow in the ground. He said the ground is not frozen. And I said, is it possible to go through a winter in his location without the ground freezing, even though many, many, many nights are below a zero Fahrenheit? And he, he said it is. Some years that happens, not every year. But that gives the possibility then to actually maybe plant some species that could potentially overwinter and, and not be limited just to those who that are planted, uh, species planted in the spring. Now, one of the things that can be done in these areas that is, um, is colder or shorter season is to try to push the limits on seeding a little bit. <clears throat> uh, the picture you see on the left of the drill out in the snow is from Dwayne Beck in uh, uh, central South Dakota. This is something there he has planted spring wheat. And this, as I recall, this picture was actually taken, I think, the week of Christmas or thereabouts. Um, the idea in doing this is to get the seed in the ground in a very niche period of time that does not happen every year, meaning the ground is not totally frozen, but frozen enough that you can get out there possibly when it's a little bit on the moisture side or wet side. And then your colders can cut down through. Now, the, the picture on the right is a close-up of my drill. Uh, now, this was several years ago. My drill looks a little different now. I have narrower gauge wheels and so forth on it. But uh, this is where uh, this technique can be used anywhere where you get freezing conditions. And we were just talking beforehand how some areas are really wet this fall. And I'll just say this is for those of you anywhere. Uh, no matter where you live, where if you want to still plant cereal rye or it's late and the ground is just too wet to do that, uh, you can wait till the, the this this timing where you get a cold uh, period of weather coming in and right before, well, after it freezes, I'll just say a little bit, a bit before it freezes too much that you can actually get seed in the ground. Now, obviously, if you have wet spots in your field, ain't going to work. Or after you have to know where they are, you got to plant around. You'll swamp the tractor and a, and a drill, okay? This is just to be able to plant in wet conditions uh, where where you're, you're utilizing that uh, kind of occurrence where you can still cut down through the light frost. I've done this a couple times in uh, both uh, late fall, early winter, and also early spring or late winter. Um, and, and again, it doesn't even present itself e every year. Uh, my favorite story is I started at 11 p.m. one night. The temperature had gotten down at that point to about 25 degrees Fahrenheit, started planting, 
and it really was dropping quickly. And by 2.30 a.m., the temperature got to 20, and my colders, my, my discs were starting to come out of the ground. It was frozen too much. And that's the point where I quit. Um, so, uh, again, you can wait till morning sometimes if it's not that cold, and then go in early in the morning until it falls out, if it's, if it's going to warm up or the sun hits it and it gets uh, kind of smeary and slimy and so forth. Um, so this is a technique, and I call it freeze seeding, that can be used anywhere. But even if you are in the north, it's a way you can maybe get something planted particularly early in the spring if you're planting your spring crops. Um, at things like oats and, and barley, spring barley, spring wheat, all those spring cereals can be planted really early, even though they may not germinate for a month or two. So I uh, want to spend some time on that because it applies to a lot of us here of an opportunity to do it. I uh, want to uh, highlight that a grazing system is ideal, and obviously not all farmers are cut out to do that. Uh, it is something that in in uh, areas, though, I've been kind of amazed where how far uh, north in these short season climates where cattle are being used. And certainly, if you're using cattle, there is a potential here. Uh, and just a few things to highlight. The idea basically would be to plant small grains in May uh, or whenever you can get into uh, into your fields, whenever they thaw out or so forth. And I, and I just listed a few there. There's a lot more. I just put a few there, oats, barley, wheat, triticale, peas. These are all basically spring type uh, uh, selections of these species. And those of you who are in the north, you understand that, you know that. Um, one idea then is, of course, you can graze that over the summer, but you can also intentionally use that for harvesting as hay. And again, you need to have some hay over the winter. Uh, so you can harvest it as hay in August. And sometimes that regrowth, and this depends on the species you plant, but that regrowth can then provide some uh, uh, forage for your cattle to graze into the fall. Or you can replant uh, cool season cover crops that will grow well into the fall uh, that won't be affected by the light frost and, and, and so forth. Uh, so then, you know, you can graze on this basically as long as you can, uh, even cover crops planted in May and go on to, uh, it, it may get to almost maturity where you, where there's coming out in seeds. Uh, once the frost comes in and actually stops them from growing, you can still graze that uh, all the way into winter. Again, depending how much snow you have and so forth can be a factor how long that'll go. But I have been amazed seeing what people have done turning their cattle out into uh, crops that were grown and are now, they look totally dead. Um, one of the other things you can do is to uh, then feed your hay over the winter. And one, uh, as, one way of doing that is what they call bale grazing. And uh, those of you who have cattle are probably familiar with this. Uh, and again, it does depend on the amount of snow. If you get a lot of snow, this may not work as well, uh, but it, it still can because you can uh, place your bales around the field so that your cattle can go out there and essentially just graze them right off the bales. And this picture you see is from Gabe Brown, North Dakota. Uh, all of you probably have heard of him. What is unique is the way the bales are placed. Um, sometimes I've seen people put their bales as a windbreak, that the cattle are actually start eating that windbreak, for, as, if you will. Or you can place your bales in the worst spots of your field where you need more nutrients. So as the cattle eat, they also deposit the manure around that area. And you can use that strategically to build up poorer sections of the field. And I, I think that is pretty cool. And, and just to show you how we all can learn from these strategies, um, here on my farm, I do a, a strong uh, uh, variation of that where this time of year we have a lot of the uh, squash that we can't sell, a hard winter squash. And so I have a small herd of buffalo and they love their squash. So we place them in my small pasture on the worst parts of it 
so that that is where they eat and then that's where the fertility goes back on so again just a good example here of some of these concepts you can apply them literally anywhere in the world um, so another one that i don't have a picture of but i did see when i was in north dakota once was what they call swath grazing where in the fall uh, where they'll go in with a swather uh, and actually cut their whatever they were growing and put it in a swath to keep it together a little bit more and then the cattle can graze that and that's primarily for areas that do not receive a lot of precipitation uh, areas that are, have higher precip uh, that 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 swath would probably start rotting before the cattle would would eat it but uh, again it's just an option out there uh, for for people to do I'm going to pause here a second and uh, any of you guys have questions, I'm going to open everything up here. Any of you have questions about the, uh, the, the, the animal component or anything we've talked, we're going to switch gears here uh, about inter intercropping, companion cropping. But any comments, observations about growing cover crops in northern climates as it relates to grazing and anything I've talked about? Anyone have any comments or questions? Anybody? Okay. We will hey, move you? on. Um, Steve. Okay, go ahead. Just in time. Sorry. I. Okay, have start over, ever, Aaron. I was wondering if you'd ever heard of anybody trying to broadcast seed ahead of a snow or anything like that on, on these kind of cold season plantings i have not i'm going to divert that to our resident northern experts derek or andy i know you're from the north uh, have you ever heard of broadcasting uh seeds out there before a snow is that a is that an option does that work is that a good idea any comments on that andy yeah um I haven't heard anything about it. Most of the time when we get snow, we have frozen ground. I think probably runoff of the seeds is in yeah. the back of our minds. If we would do anything, they'd all end up in the low areas and the sloughs, and then you'd just have sure. trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Derek, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I'd say that's the same. And really, we have virtually no luck with broadcasting in any form here. You know, we're just too dry. And yeah. seems what Annie says, by the time we get yeah. snow, they're going to frozen so it just doesn't pan out yep yeah 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 so down here in nebraska um something that we recommend for native grass seeding is to broadcast in the in the fall or, or actually november and then uh, allow the seed to work in with snow after snow after snow and it seems to place that seed down in into the residue somehow and and the seeds work in naturally but um and again, I can understand seed to soil contact. So I was just wondering if anybody had heard anything about that or. Yeah. Well, is it, is it working? Is it working in that context, Aaron? It seems to have some success um, depending on the seed bed. Okay. Um, so I guess yeah, I would, my comment would be, uh, yeah. yeah, my comment would be if you are indeed using native species from your area, that would make sense that it may work because that's how nature does it. Uh, so that would be my comment, again, from afar, so to speak. So, okay, I'm gonna move on. Just a reminder, feel free to chat, uh, to actually type in over there in the chat box if you care to, to ask a question, we'll cover it, you know, when we have a moment. But um, I'm gonna move on here and uh, talk about intercropping and companion cropping. And uh, this is where we're growing two or more cash crops together. Uh, it can actually uh, be beyond that sometimes where you can have a cash crop and then you could have what we'll call cover crops that you intend for them to like winter kill and so forth. But um, some of the examples of doing this and, and, and again, for northern areas uh, that, that have this opportunity <clears throat> and it's, it's a, just a novel way of taking advantage of the diversity and the synergies that happen when you a mix different species together and we've been we know it works in cover cropping why can't we do it in our cash cropping and uh that, that i just put some 
some some areas that I know to be successful. Uh, canola, peas, and hairy vetch grow well together. You can harvest them together and you can separate the seeds out because of the different seed size. And if you're in an area that's using these as a cover crop, it's a great cash crop to use there. You can use some cereal grains like triticale or suya rye with hairy vetch is another option. There's a lot of options out there. Um, I did not mention uh, more, <clears throat> but you got to ask the question then, what is the potential market in your area? And, and I know that is going to vary from geography uh, to geography, but, uh, but this whole thing of companion cropping is really appealing, I think, for further north. And <clears throat> again, I guess I want to pause right here and I, I know that uh, Derek is doing it, and uh, I, I'm not sure, Andy, if you are. Derek, you, you want to comment a little bit here and kind of expand, uh, if you will, what I just shared, because I know you're, uh, I'm not sure to what extent you're doing it, but um, if, you could, if you could comment on that, Derek, a little bit more, I'd, I'd really uh, appreciate your adding to our experience, um, if that's possible, um, if you're able to get on now. If not, maybe we'll catch you a little bit later. Um, okay, go ahead, Derek. Okay, yeah, um, we've been, I know Andy's intercropping too, but we started in about 11 okay. with Spearmint, and then uh, we've been just kind of gradually growing, but we're intercropping over half the farm now, and yeah, it's been positive. I mean, we're d doing it because it works. So, okay. yeah, I mean, we're in the neighborhood of three to 3,500 acres, I guess, a year sort of thing and uh we mm -hmm. separate as much as we can at harvest but yeah it's 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 been a game changer for us i mean it's allowed us to grow things we normally wouldn't have grown i guess put it that way you know yeah. and we've reduced fungicide yeah. to use virtually nothing um yeah there's a whole bunch of positive we could probably do a whole hour deal on just yeah. on intercrop hey there we go we're gonna have to do that sometime well that's great i i, I that's just a positive endorsement there um, any particular ones you would like to share? I mean, you don't have to tell us all your secrets, but uh, you know what, 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 anything you want, we could share, or would like to share. What, what works well? Well, the two big ones I always talk about are, are flax and chickpeas, because chickpeas are really high intense, high fungicide use crop here, and with some of the Saskatchewan, most guys are four to six passes of fungicide a year, and we're down like on our. Hmm. Our Kabuli types, we can do it with one, and our Desi types, we can do it with no fungicide at all. You know, mm -hmm. we've done that, you know, for multiple years now. It's not just a one-off. So that's been a huge game changer, mm -hmm. you know, and we're able to basically maintain yield plus get a benefit of having flax on top of it. And uh, and peas and some kind of brassica works really well. That's the other, you know, bust mustard or, or canola, whatever you prefer. But those, mm -hmm. especially if we grow the peas that want to lay down. Right, the peas that are a nightmare to harvest, yep. forage peas, maple peas. Yep. So let me something the trellis works great. Yep. Awesome. Now, do you want to weigh in, Andy? Um, you're out there in uh, in Alberta. Wouldn't mind hearing a little bit what you're doing uh, with uh, intercropping, companion cropping. Uh, just to just hear a little bit about what's working, maybe what's not working. Uh, maybe you could just comment here on what we've been talking about. Are you there, Andy? Well, maybe you can catch up to us then a little bit later, um, but I uh, would love to hear a little bit more about what you're doing. Is there anybody else that has questions about this intercropping companion co cropping aspect? It, it, it's not uh, totally uh, for the northern areas. Uh, it can be done. I'm doing it here myself. Uh, uh, so, and, and I think it's, it's, I mean, Derek used the word game changer. Um, I think I can almost say that as well. Uh, we'll see. I'm the I'm the second year into it. I really like what I'm seeing. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's really something to be said there about trying to grow uh, multiple cash crops together. Uh, and uh, you got to be creative. Uh, you got to do what works in your area and all that. But um, it's definitely something's there. Any Steve, other questions? Steve. Go ahead. Steve, this is this is Nathan. I'm in North yes. Central North Dakota. Okay. Uh, I grew uh, just a success story uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. I grew soybeans and canola together and hadn't known anybody really who'd done that and uh, worked out great. I got uh, a little more than half of a soybean crop and a little more than half of a 
canola crop and okay. um, equaled about one and a quarter crops and okay. um, was was 27 acres only on my farm, but mm -hmm. it was one the most profitable 27 acres I had. So just a small success story there. I'm going to expand so, it for next year. Okay, so they're very easy to separate because it's, it's a very – did you separate the seeds then? I, I did. I separated them at harvest, and it's uh, it, it's very easy to do with a rotary cleaner. It's just uh, it's just so slow. I mean, if you're running two yeah. machines in the field like we do, and whatever, mm -hmm. uh, it, it it's just uh, it's really going to slow our harvest process down. I think I've, uh -huh. I've heard Derek speak, and he bins a lot of it together uh, and separates it later. And we're going to have to yeah. go to to doing that. I think if we yeah. expand on this. Yes. Well, that's the thing when you when you when you're doing this stuff new, you you have to do it a couple years to kind of validate it, and then you build the infrastructure around it. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I I hear you. Um, uh, yeah, fortunately for me here, I have a local seed. They want to most of the stuff I'm growing is is actually for cover crop seeds. So I have a, a place that will actually take it from me, basically out of, off the combine. Um, so. But that's that's really cool to hear. Uh, I wonder, is there any other aspects you notice you got you got a great yield? Doesn't surprise us. Uh, I don't know insects, insect control, in, uh, disease, anything that you normally contend with. Anything different there? I, I never used any fertilizer or any fungicide on the soybean and canola yeah. mix, and it was yeah. um, everything was great. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, I've just, okay. I've just not, anybody I've talked to who does, does this doesn't seem to, uh, doesn't seem to need any of those products anymore. Right. So, no, that's. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to that down the road. Yep. That's becoming common. Is there any other creative mixes designed more for cash crops that you, any of you heard of that you want to share? Are you done? Steve, yeah. have you seen those those videos on Twitter of guys harvesting uh, wheat over the top of growing soybeans? They've got yes. some yards on the yes. on the like said, that's pretty novel. Yes, uh, I think that's got some yes. merit in, in uh, the Midwest here. Yeah, Jason Mock, I believe is his name from Indiana, has been doing that. Um, I mean, he, well, I've been kind of observing what he's doing. It's it 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 looks it looks fascinating he's doing it really in the context of manure uh trying to better utilize his manure uh it's it's very highly managed and i i'm hearing some other people do it not everybody has had his success but i think it's one of those things that's very highly managed and you'd have to write a book on it to probably share all his nuances of, of how that makes it work but these are the kind of things that i feel are exciting in the times that we live uh, where where we can just take everything to a new level and and being able to actually you know grow things uh, with less inputs and that seems to be well that is a trend in in the movement here that a lot of us are part of whatever you want to call it so that certainly is exciting stuff so okay, I believe we want to move on. Uh, we'll have time for questions a little bit later. I do really appreciate the comments and everything uh, here. I did want to touch a little bit on interseeding, which is the term we use of planting cover crops into a growing cash crop. And in the context of our conversation today, uh, this would be the southern fringes, or the, I'll just say the warmer fringes of our of our topic. Uh, where the if you if you're able to grow corn, to be able to interseed cover crops into that corn is a no-brainer. Um, in areas to the north, it works it works um, very consistently. This is actually in Quebec, and again, I know Quebec has a, a, a fairly large variant in climate, but uh, nonetheless, um, if you're an area that that does grow corn, uh, this is definitely something to to consider and, and not spend a lot of time on this today, but just wanted to mention it. The species I recommend in these northern northern climates or colder climates would be radish, hairy vet, cereal rye, and maybe others. Uh, typically, interseeding uh, in in where it's really been promoted, uh, you would want to use annual ryegrass instead of cereal rye. But when we're getting into those shorter shorter season, we want to switch to something like cereal rye. 
um, is, is what seems to be um, appropriate for that. Um, so the next topic is perennial versus annual species. Again, we're talking about northern climates, colder climates. Um, most of you know all this here. I'm not going to spend much time on it. But for perennial uh, plantings, seed generally costs more, but you only have to plant it uh, once every several years, so you can kind of defray that cost. Uh, another thing about perennials is you're kind of locked into the species for a few years, and if you got the right stuff, that's a good thing. Not saying that one is right, right and one is wrong, but there has been a shift to more annual species. Uh, the general seed cost is less expensive, but then you have to plant it every year, or maybe some systems you'd be planting it twice a year, depending how aggressive you are, even in a short season. Um, typically, you'll get higher forage yields. If we're talking about forage. You get higher forage yields and maybe even higher forage quality off an annual. It's because you got so many options and so many mixes that you can cobble together. And you have the option to change over time. Those who are progressive in this uh, typically don't stay with a given mix or a given group of species. They typically evolve. So uh, again, this is just a kind of a really quick overview of that for northern climates. There seems to be a trend toward more of the annual species. And then when we're talking about what some of them are, we're going to be looking at species that uh, that typically like the cooler weather because you don't you're just not going to get hot temperatures usually. And this is why radishes have done so good. They they respond really good to long days um, and cool temperatures. Uh, they just love to thrive in that long sunny days. Uh, fava beans is one that um, I have heard mentioned. Um, the place where I'm going this week. At least the people I was talking to didn't know that they were growing that far, far north. I, I think it's one to look at. And, of course, we could talk about our peas, spring or winter peas, mainly spring peas in these situations, a triticale or other spring and winter grains. Again, the reason I put the variables in there, it depends if you have snow cover. If you don't, we'll, we'll determine sometimes if you can grow something that will overwinter or not. Uh, sorghum sedan can work in some areas. Uh, the... The challenge with that is in a short season, if you happen to have a late frost or an early frost, it can wipe it out. Um, it, it's it's one of those that you would want to have in a mix, but boy, if you get that plant and get it gone, it can really put on some tonnage, even in those uh, northern areas. If you're looking mainly as a forage, uh, that's, that's what uh, a lot of this is here. Um, so I'm going to uh, wrap up here with my moose story. And uh, I, I, uh, I got to tell you that this is not my picture. I did have a picture of 40, yes, 40 moose in Alaska grazing on radishes. Uh, the picture was taken uh, several years ago with a very, I guess you say old cell phone or whatever was sent to me. This picture is very grainy. I didn't keep the picture. At least I couldn't find it. Uh, but I happened to find this picture here. But uh, uh, when I was in the sea business, we shipped a pallet of radish seed to Alaska. I was quite surprised they were even interested. And I was like, I have no idea if this is going to work. And I go, oh, yeah, it should work. We have our long days and everything. And they really liked it. Um, and then they sent me a picture of 40 moose. I never knew you could get a group of 40 that that much together but apparently they really like the radishes so uh, uh i really wish i could find that picture but uh it, it looks like this could be canola or rape or something that that moose is out there i have no idea where this is taken but the point of it is is no matter where you go i've been to australia where they had problems with kangaroos eating their cover crops uh and and no matter where you go you know, we have we have uh, either issues or challenges or opportunities, and uh, and and this whole thing. It, to, to me, again, it's another reason why I love this whole cover crop movement because of uh, just the dynamics and the diversity that it brings. Uh, so anyway, that kind of wraps it up. Uh, I'm gonna open up here for everybody. Uh, what are some of your questions and comments? Just have a slide here next week. I'm going to talk about how to negotiate a lease that includes cover crops. This is a big topic because there's a lot of 
uh, pushback sometimes to do this from landowners, but there's also farmers who are committed to cover crops. They want to use cover crops, but they don't want that value that they put into the soil and the soil health to be taken away from them uh, by another farmer in a couple years. So very important conversation to have, I believe. And um, so that's what I'm going to talk about next week. So what's your uh, additional questions today about our topic or any other cover crop uh, question that you would like to ask or comments? Anybody Steve, have a comment? This, Go ahead, Steve, Barry. This, this is Barry. Uh, <clears throat> we have, I'm not in your northern, northern reaches, but we've had right. a really wet fall. So we had a lot of people that had bought their pr cover crops and and now it's just getting so late and it's turned cold mm. what's your best advice i mean should we should we go ahead and try that uh, late fall kind of frost yeah. seeding or freeze yeah. seeding or yeah. wait till spring yeah uh if it's cereal rye berry i'm gonna say if you get a window to put it in the ground i'm putting it in the ground and you may have to utilize that uh, strategy that i explained there freeze seeding um, and, and you got to be ready for that. Uh, either if, if, if you, if the temperatures aren't going to get very cold, you know, you think it's going to be cold enough. You want to get your drill filled up the evening before the day before. So you're ready to go at 4 AM or 6 AM or whenever, or, or, you know, we watching the weather forecast and, 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 you know, it looks like we may have this opportunity, but even if it, even if it, let's just say it would dry out. I mean, anytime during, I have literally planted cover crops every month of the year here on my farm. And no, there's some years I can't plant in December, January, February. Uh, but just saying I've done it. I planted uh, actually annual rye grass on January the 5th, the day before I left the national no-till conference one year, which is kind of ironic. I planted um, uh, cover crops and I, I, I mixed a bunch of things together and, at that time of the year, nothing's going to grow anyway, and as long as the seed doesn't rot, it'll come up in the spring. And as long as that's not the first field you want to plant, I think there's some worthwhile to it. So a quick answer, Barry, is I'm if I have a pallet or two of cereal rye in my shed, I'm planting if I can get it in the ground. And and I would say if you, I wouldn't I wouldn't broadcast. There's just this time of the year now is just so subject to everything. Um, even water runoff collecting the seeds and and it can do that in, in, in a you know sloping area birds will come in and get it uh whatever um so i i would definitely if there's any option to get it in the ground i would i would go for it um is there uh, any other discussion on that any advice uh, uh brent i wouldn't mind hearing from you uh what's your thoughts on uh super late planted like cover crops like cereal rye you have any comment on that or anybody else here that has experience with it? Anyone? I got a question, Steve. Uh, sure. When you plant a, a winter rye that and it, and it doesn't vernalize over the winter and it comes up in the spring, germinates in the spring, yeah. comes up, it, yes. it won't yes. make a head, right? Yes. So how, how else does the plant differ as it grows? Well, I'm glad you or brought that up. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Nathan, because it is true uh, there comes a point where it just won't grow. Although that being said, I have been somewhat surprised at, at the growth of it. Um, so basically, um, here again, depends what your strategies are and so forth. But if you want to increase your seeding rate, uh, you know, to try to overcome a weak stand or a weak plant, uh, basically a cereal rye looks uh, when you plant it late like that, when it starts growing, it just it looks a little wimpy, uh, is the way I would put it, and it just doesn't have the vigor and the growth and everything. I still think it's worth it, uh, but if you have the seed paid for and you don't want to be looking at it all year next year, I'd still put it in the ground. Just don't expect you're going to get a huge lush stand that's going to come out and you're going to harvest it for seed. That ain't going to happen. Uh, so that's a few things there, and it's a good good point you brought up. Um, does that concur with what your experience is, Nathan? I haven't, I haven't, I've, I don't really only got into the rye this last year and had a fantastic experience with it, seeded plant, soybeans green. And, but I was just kind of thinking, you know, I seeded it over for cover crops. I seeded a couple thousand acres of it here mm -hmm. over, mm -hmm. oh, three months. 
Yeah. And, and so I was just kind of curious as to, uh, I think there's some of it that, that maybe didn't germinate, uh, mm-hmm. might've been too cold. And so I'm just yep. kind of curious as to what might, might happen with those plants as, as opposed to the ones that yep. just got out of the ground a little bit. Yep. No, nope. so I thought there the might later... be a place for that, that. If it doesn't make a head, maybe you leave it grow, plant a light rate and leave it grow in the soybeans. Try not to kill it out. Maybe, maybe it wouldn't hurt the soybeans too bad if it, uh, if it didn't make yeah. a head and it wasn't taking lots of nutrients to fill fill a head, it'd be uh, moisture I'd be concerned about. Um, but then again, you know, depending on your herbicide traits and what all you're doing, there's there's it's not hard to kill rye if you don't have to have traded herbicide, you don't have, to have GMO beans to kill rye in in soybeans. So you have options. Uh, and yeah, maybe I, I know some people in a, in a wet spring are leaving their rye grow until it starts to dry out if it is wet. And they'll leave the soybeans grow to, you know, the first trifoliate or, or wherever. Um, if, if, as far as that not going to seed, I'm not sure if I would rely on that to be 100% true. You don't want to be dealing with rye seed in your soybeans unless you're using the soybeans yourself for your own feed or something. So that would be, but then again, if you see heads coming, you could have the option of taking it out before those seeds mature. That would be something I watch really close. So great question. Uh, Brent, yeah, you want to comment on, on, on anything or the especially late seeded uh, rye? Uh, can you hear me okay, first of all? Yep. Go okay, ahead. good. The, uh, just on the on the last um, talk there about harvesting soybeans, even if there's some seed heads in there from the small grain, that, that doesn't seem to have ever been a problem for for us really that it seems like it you know it, they just clean out and blow out the back and the beans go into combine mm-hmm. um on the on the idea of of seeding late i guess we've never seeded super late to where the seed didn't even germinate it seems like if it does germinate apparently it does vernalize if, it, if you at least get germination mm-hmm. um, but but the one thing that i thought about if i had a field that was coming up with a real light stand for whatever reason um Mm-hmm. Or if I thought it might come up with a light stand because I seeded late or something along those lines, I wonder if I couldn't go in there with with oats, you know, in mm. whatever time is appropriate for your latitude, and 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 you know, seed some oats, broadcast some oats over the top, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, at least get a, you know, put a bushel of oats out. It wouldn't cost very much, and it would help mm-hmm. fill in fill in any any gaps. I would think. Yeah. Oh, you're you're exactly right, Brent. And you could go early. Uh, I'm not sure if you were on. We were talking about freeze seeding or not, but you could do that with oats, like in February, even if the conditions are, are right, um, and get them in the ground. They'll grow when it warms up. Uh, but there again, you don't want to plant your first soybeans probably into that. Or as you stated, if it's a low, if it's a light stand, and you want to thicken it up, um, you can go in with oats. Um, that has certainly been done. I just uh, was 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 given some more land to rent that I wasn't aware of. It this it was just early this spring, this past spring, and so I went in and planted oats uh, in March right away, and it happened to be to be planted into hard winter squash. So I wasn't I knew I wasn't planting until the second week of June anyway, and the oats were starting to head out. Uh, it's a kind of a maybe a, an, an odd situation for most of us, but for me that that really worked well. Um, so I think your idea of putting oats out there super early for, for either a weak stand that just didn't survive or you just didn't get a chance to plant a cover crop. I would not plant cereal rye in March. Um, I, I just don't think you know, oats is like I'm going to say this isn't science, but, you know, it's twice as good as uh, in, a, in a spring growth as cereal rye would be uh, for the biomass it's going to put on rooting action, all that stuff. That would be at least what, what I would say. I would definitely switch over to oats in the spring, a spring oat. That's what it's kind of made for um, to do. So anyone else want to chime in on that topic? Other questions you may have, either about cold season, short season climates, or any other cover crop question? I've got a question. Sure. Go ahead, Derek. 
Does anybody have some kind of a list of shade tolerant species or that sort of thing? Because we tried interseeding into our standing durum this year, like into our small grains, just because we're trying to overcome that short fall period and, mm -hmm. and you know, shade is a real problem. So is there mm -hmm. species that are better than others? You know, definitely on the cool end of the spe of the spectrum, I mm -hmm. guess is what we're looking for. Um, yeah, sugar beets were a complete wipeout. Um, the clovers didn't, nothing did very well. So yeah. just curious. And then it got dry. <laughs> so it was a train wreck, but we're learning. Yeah. yeah. Anyone have any suggestions for Derek there on on a shade tolerant uh, species that could be with his uh, Durham wheat? Now, Derek, are you trying to plant this after the wheat is growing? I'm assuming go down through the row middles or something, or what? How how would that actually work? Yeah, we started. So we we made a little drill on 15 inch spacing, like a nine meter. Um, mm -hmm inch space drill and so we could kind of go back and go in between the rows we thought that little bit extra space would help but mm. uh yeah we started pretty much in june and then we went every week for seven mm -hmm. weeks you know mm. every friday i was on like i did it every friday trying to figure out you know time. <laughs> didn't know right nobody's done right. this and yeah. uh yeah it was and then we did get some success with with a little bit of the clovers but none of them did great you know mm -hmm. uh, for just looking mm -hmm. for uh, suggestions well, there's only one suggestion comes to mind is probably not going to work uh, for you, and 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 that is orchard grass. Uh, orchard grass is called orchard grass because it was bred, designed, or created, or selected to live in the shade of an orchard. And we forget that, even though we use the word all the time. And uh, in the context of here at Penn State University, their interceding research with corn, they found that orchard grass was very effective in establishing and surviving over the summer. Um, the only problem is it is a relatively shallow rooted crop. Um, it certainly has some soil health characteristics, but uh, if it gets dry, it, it, it that was the weak point. It would, it would tend to die out. It just doesn't have the roots to get down and keep getting moisture if it gets dry. Uh, so, Orchard grass, um, I'm wondering, um, of course, it's grass, not a legume, so you're not going to get any nitrogen out of it, but you know, I'm wondering, is there any old varieties out there that, that we've kind of either shelved or abandoned now that we need to bring back uh, and then use those genetics to try to uh, kind of tweak them to what we need today? And, uh, you know, what others, what are some species that may be back in the in the day, so to speak, that could work? Uh, I don't have a uh, an answer for your question, Derek, but I, I think if if someone would take time to look back at some of the species in the in the old, I'll just say the old days, there might be something there for us. Okay, well, that's good. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, go ahead, Brent. Uh, one thing on that, you know, Michael Vitito in Washington, Iowa, has been doing some work on that, and and um, I, I think there's more in more to be learned there but it, it seems yeah. to me like he said only really cereal rye like was about the only good thing that would consistently mm -hmm. hang out under a canopy okay. of corn in that in that okay. specific situation mm -hmm. so i i haven't honestly tried it myself um besides doing some hand seeding and the rye did live mm -hmm. but that was under a, you know a corn crop so yeah that's, that's a great question i don't think i yeah I'm not a huge interseeding fan yet because I I just don't want to go out there and try to reinvent the wheel when other people are already working on it. I guess at yeah. this point. Yeah, I think I can answer for Derek that he's probably not interested in cereal rye on his farm, or particularly in his wheat. I'm I'm just assuming that, but uh, very good point there, Brent. Uh, you brought up. Uh, Aaron mentioned here in the chat if you didn't see it. He said that the Midwest cover crop decision tool has a ranking for shade toler tolerance. I'm sure there's probably no, uh, you know, magic uh, species on there, but at least maybe there's something there you didn't know about, uh, Derek, that you could try. It's a great, uh, appreciate you mentioning that, Aaron. I, I wasn't aware that they had a shade tolerance on. And then speaking of cover crop decision tools, they seem to be popping up uh, here and there now. There's a lot of them out there, which is awesome. Uh, there's, there's so many variables go into cover crop decision making that I don't think there's going to be the one tool that is best. But if you can run some scenarios to a couple different tools 
that's that's a really great um, resource that is popping up around. I was just given another one to evaluate, and I don't think it's public yet, but uh, it's fascinating some of the stuff that they're they're pulling together, including you know weather data and and all how that relates to this particular species is kind of some cool stuff. So, okay, we just have a couple minutes here. Um, another question that anyone might have pressing you'd like to ask while we're on this call and all this wisdom we have here. Anybody else? I guess I got another intercropping. Yep. Given where I'm at, intercropping, I think to, if you want to add diversity, intercropping is going to be a better way than cover cropping because we just don't get mm -hmm. enough fall yeah. to get any growth. So, so I'm focusing that way. But when I'm choosing when I'm choosing two crops to put together, like the soybeans and canola, soybeans will make nitrogen, obviously, mm -hmm. and um, I've, I've heard uh, I've heard that uh, a brassica will uh, somehow mineralize some phosphorus, and that could be mm -hmm. good for the soybeans. But I don't know if there's other characteristics of other plants like that, or if you just simply pick them based on maturity, uh, and and you just got to try. Or or is there other criteria you can use when you're kind of trying to to make up what what would be a good intercrop? Yeah. Well, I uh, wouldn't mind hearing from others while you're if you have a if you have a comment, get it ready. I'll just say that obviously they have to be somewhat compatible to harvest together. The nice thing about canola and beans is they're easy to thrash. They, there's no issues there. Uh, uh, if if you use some um, other other species out there that are more difficult. Uh, I know some triticales are harder to thrash and you don't want to mess up your other species in that. So I, I think similar maturity, uh, similar for combine to be able to harvest them, thrash them, separate the seeds, you know, with, without losing too much. Um, you know, obviously you can't, you have to keep your fan speed down when you're uh, using a small seed uh, cover crop and or small seeded crop. So that's a factor. So I, I guess you just got to keep thinking, Nathan, um, you know, and th th this is like the, the cutting edge of the cutting edge. Uh, so we don't have a lot of experience, but I'm just amazed at what I hear. I mean, that's the first I heard today, of what you did. So that's awesome. Um, I can add that to the list, so to speak. Um, so and that's kind of why I did it. I hadn't heard of anybody else doing that <laughs> one. So I just well, threw it out there and it worked. Yep. Crazy. That's good. Well, keep thinking. Um, that's, that's what this whole thing is, is about. Any other, anyone, any other questions for our call today? Why, well, hey, thanks. appreciate this good interchange. Um, got some new people been joining lately. I appreciate those coming on. Uh, and, uh, you guys have a great week. Look, I look forward to, uh, learning more in my travels to Alberta this week and, uh, next week, we'll talk about how to uh, establish and create leases that, inv that involve cover crops. I think it's a very important topic. So you all have a great week. Thanks again for your support. Thanks, Steve. Yep. Thank you, Steve.